everyone, and welcome to another amazing Chow and Chat. My name is Marvin Alonzo Greer, and I'm the Education and Visitor Experience Lead at Soldiers Memorial Military Museum. We want to thank you for tuning in today for this amazing Chow and Chat we have lined up and um, that you are all about to hear. But before we get started, we'd like to thank our sponsors, Billman Trucking Company, um, who's been in service since 1906 and whose generous donations help make this Chow and Chat possible and through donations like this allow for us to bring you free uh, programming. Now today's Chow and Chat will operate um, just like most of our other Chow and Chats. For those of you who are new, uh, our Chow and Chats are going to operate uh, where you'll see our, you'll hear our panelists uh, speak and present. Uh, you all are currently muted and your cameras um, are off. However, um, if you do have a question, we do ask that you put that in the challenge, uh, in the Q&A box. At the bottom of, uh, left of your screen, you should see a box that says uh, Q&A. And if you, uh, if you click there, you'll be able to type a question. Um, now, we won't be answering those questions until the, towards the end of the program, um, but if you have questions throughout, and if you're like me, and you tend to forget your questions, you can either write them down or just type them right into the, uh, the Q&A box, um, and we will see them, um, and we'll make sure that our panelists are able to answer those questions. Now, we'd like to put, uh, put this conversation in a little bit of context before we get started. This conversation will be about Manifest Destiny. Manifest Destiny was the belief in which Americans uh, believed that, and Europeans believed that um, uh, of westward expansion, that there should be, that America should be from sea to shining sea. But um, that also came at a price. There were millions of indigenous people uh, that, uh, that were displaced and also um, many people of Mexican descent. And as you'll learn in this discussion, um, who, whose lands were also uh, taken from them. That being, uh, that being said, Manifest Destiny shaped, um, shaped the America that we see today and also helped form American values. Its military actions were uh, begun right here in St. Louis. We want to remember and honor the indigenous people whose land that we sit, live, and work on today. The title of this program, Good Words and Broken Promises, American Legacies of Manifest Destiny, was inspired by a quote by Nez Perce uh, Chief, jo uh, Nez Perce um, American Indian Chief Joseph, who said, it makes my heart sick when I remember all the good words and broken promises when it comes to dealing with the United States government and Indian affairs. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our moderator for today's program, Dr. Kiana Irvin. A St. Louis native, Dr. Irvin is an associate professor of history at the University of Missouri, Columbia. She earned a bachelor's degree in history and African American studies uh, from Duke University and a master's and PhD in history from Washington University here in St. Louis. She is the author of the award-winning Gateway to Equality, Black Women and the Struggle for Economic Justice in St. Louis. A recipient of the Career Enhancement Fellowship from the Woodrow Wilson National Fellowship Foundation. She, is, uh, she has published peer-reviewed article review, articles, reviews and essays in International Labor and Working Class History, Journal of Civil, uh, Civil and Human Rights, Souls, a Critical Journal of Black Politics, Culture and Society, New Labor Forms, Los Angeles Reviews of Books, Labor Studies in Working Class History, Journal of Southern History, and Journal of American Ethnic History. Uh, sorry, Ethnic History. Without further ado, I will turn it over. I'll stop sharing my screen. And I'd like to turn it over uh, to my friend, Kiana Urban. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marvin. I really appreciate um, this opportunity. Um, it's an honor to 
moderate um, this panel of, of wonderful speakers and guests. So um, let me begin by introducing our panelists and then we'll, we'll get right into our discussion. So first, Alyssa Lazzaroni is a social worker originally from San Antonio, Texas. She's worked in several nonprofits in St. Louis City County and St. Charles County, practicing psychotherapy with children, youth, and families. She co-founded the St. Louis Doula Project, which is a grassroots and interdisciplinary nonprofit made up of doulas and social work public health professionals who are passionate about increasing accessibility of doula services or physical and emotional support during labor and birth that is shown to improve birth outcomes for folks who are incarcerated and transitioning from incarceration. She is Shikana, she's a Shikana small business owner of Rooted Life LLC, where she offers services that support individuals and organizations through trauma-informed consulting, coaching, and individualized mindfulness and wellness sessions. She's passionate about social justice and is an active community member connecting art, healing, and empowerment. She's worked on several projects around Native American issues and reclaiming ancestral land in St. Louis and Missouri. Gwen Moore is the curator of urban landscape and community identity at the Missouri History Museum, focusing on race, ethnicity, and race relations in St. Louis. Gwen has been associated with the museum since 1998, working as a researcher, community programmer, and oral historian. Her current, research, her current area of research is concerned with social movements with a particular interest in civil rights activism. Pretty Anderson is a European American woman descended from many groups of colonists in North America many families of enslavers, and one line of indigenous Americans. She co-leads the Monticello community, is a founding member of Coming to the Table, and a former board member with the historic Stagville Foundation and with the Slave Dwelling Project. She currently convenes two Coming to the Table anti-racism discussion groups. Her professional life involves leadership development and executive coaching. Prinny lives in Durham, North Carolina. Last but not least, Rhea Sharon is a Filipino American artist. She was born and raised in Manila and came to the US to pursue her education. She is the result of a long tradition of Filipinos studying in the States, dating back to the conclusion of the Filipino American War. Her great grandfather, Ramon Ochoa, was in the inaugural class of the 100 in the Pensionado program, a fellowship initiated in 1903 by then General Governor of the Philippines, William Howard Taft. 90 years later, Rhea earned her degree in art theory and practice from Northwestern University. She currently works at Washington University in St. Louis. So that's, that's the list of, of these wonderful folks who have joined us for this conversation. I'm thrilled to, to be in conversation with them. And yeah, let's, let's get to it. Let's get to it, shall we? So let's, let's start, I guess, with um, kind of the question of just historical trauma. Um, you know, today we're talking, of course, about the legacies of Manifest Destiny and, and kind of how um, histories are expanded from that and what it means really to kind of live with these historical realities. So let's, let's start with Alyssa, and if anyone else wants to, wants to um, jump in, by all means do so. Alyssa, how are you thinking about, and how, what, how do you, would you define historical trauma? What does that look like for you and your practice and your work? Yeah, so I wanted to give a de definition from Maria. Um, I want to get the order of her name correct. Maria Yellowhorse Braveheart. Um, she's a social worker and researcher um, who has focused on historical trauma. And so I believe she defines it as um, a complex and collective trauma experienced over time and across generations by a group of people who share an identity, affiliation, or circumstance. Um, and so this initially was getting a lot of attention with looking at Holocaust survivors, but also survivors of the genocide and enslavement. 
Um, and so that really shapes how I think about trauma because it's not just an individual trauma. There's also so many instances of collective trauma that get passed down through generations. And now we're finding even now through epigenetics um, that trauma stays with a person regardless of how far down the road it is. And it's not necessarily just social factors anymore. Absolutely. Thank you so much. If any, would anyone else like to speak to that kind of historical trauma or how we think about that term? Okay, well, let's move to Prinny then. So Prinny, you, you don't live in St. Louis, but your ancestor stories um, and their legacies are quite relevant to the founding kind of, of the United States and especially to kind of St. Louis's story within that, that larger founding. So um, how have you and your family addressed the legacies of genocide and enslavement? Um, let's start there. <laughs> with, a, with a superficial question. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks, Kiana. Yeah. Just to put a little context there, um, one set of my ancestors came to New England purportedly for religious freedom but it was religious freedom for them, not for anybody else. And some of them had military, you know, participated in militias to put down the um, indigenous people that objected to them being there. Um, another part of my family came into the colony of Virginia, the British colony, and they were all about um, claiming land and making money. Um, tobacco being their primary product and clearly uh, needed to move, dispossess the people whose land they were moving into. The painful irony in that part of the story is that one of them, John Rolfe, married the daughter of the Powhatan, Pocahontas, had a child with her and his, all his uh, fellow colonists were then busily genociding all her people. So, you know, it's one part of the family is marrying and having children and then everyone else is killing the extended family <laughs> of that wife and children. In terms of how my family confronts that, um, not much, not much. Um, the part of the family that's descended from Pocahontas has, as a group, so this is speaking very generally and not referring to any one individual, been um, pretty white, pretty racist, pretty feeling themselves elite, uh, pretty eager to get out in the sunshine, used to be, get out in the sunshine and get brown, not quite seeing the irony of that. Very excited to be descended from Princess Pocahontas and not talking at all about the complexities and the pain of that story. Similarly, um, I have identified a minimum of 90 Virginia families who were landowners and enslavers over the generations. And um, for the most part, those families are not talking about their past connected to slavery. There's a small group of us who do and um, who in fact are acquainted with, and in my case, very good friends with people descended from folks they enslaved. And that's enormously healing to, to get right into it and, and talk about what happened and talk about um, bondage and rape and um, complete oppression with, you know, descendants to descendants. Um, I live in hope <laughs> that more of my family will step into that, those conversations. And then one of the reasons I'm involved with coming to the table is in an effort to get a lot of other people involved in those conversations. That's great. Yeah, and kind of as a follow-up, I mean, particularly with the work of coming to the table, like what advice might you 
you know, give to those who have similar family histories? Um, you know, how, how, how might that process kind of unfold, do you think? What might, advice might you give them? Um, you need to go learn your family history. Um, it's a really good idea to get together with some other people who have similar interests because from time to time, the things that people find are um, pretty upsetting. To find that you're descended from the perpetrator of a lynching is a pretty disturbing discovery, and so support is useful. Um, but it isn't just learning family history because we all grew up with some kind of, or at least many of us grew up with some kind of American history. It's um, the whole history, the history from the point of view of everybody involved, you know, so what would the descendants of Pocahontas people, how would they tell the history, the descendants of um, Jefferson's enslaved community, what's the story they would tell about history, and so taking it all in and being willing to look at the parts that to us in the 21st century, we feel don't reflect well on our ancestors, but it's what they did, what they were involved with. Thank you so much. Uh, let's let's move to, to Gwen for a bit. Um, so one of the things that's really kind of in, interesting me kind of in, um, and what we're seeing kind of in, in kind of a protest uh, today is kind of the linking between, you know, a kind of Black Lives Matter movement and, you know, the, the, the movement for indigenous rights, generally speaking, a kind of coalition that's forming around that. So let's, let's go back kind of to St. Louis history, the 1904 World Fair, which was, of course, a kind of celebration of American colonization, the United States kind of expanding its its empire acquiring um, land and territory and the like. So where were African Americans kind of in that moment, in the, in the, in the World's Fair moment? How did they respond to the fair? I guess that, that would be a, a good starting place, especially like the human zoos and, 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 and that kind of aspect to that fair. Well, yeah. uh, before I say anything about the World's Fair, I want, I want to say that our, our, our resident expert on the World's Fair is my uh, esteemed colleague, Sharon Smith, who is a leading scholar on the World's Fair and has done one of the most popular exhibits that we have here, which is on the World's Fair. Uh, so I, I benefit a lot from her knowledge. Uh, but I do study race in St. Louis and I was particularly interested in the interaction between race and what was going on at the World's Fair. And of course, um, people of color were very much involved uh, inside the fairgrounds and outside the fairgrounds. Let me just give a little context and say that St. Louis in 1904 was a segregated city, mm. just like any segregated city in the Deep South. The only difference was we did not necessarily have those laws, but we were segregated. And of course that was reflected in our big, the black experience with the fair. Uh, first of all, you mentioned the human zoos. And uh, the whole point of the human zoos was basically to uh, promote manifest destiny, and to uh, get uh, public buy-in uh, to American imperialism. And uh, W.J. McGee, who was the anthropologist who put together these uh, human zoos, that was his purpose. He came in with an agenda. He wanted to show that uh, whites were superior. And he did this by creating these human zoos. It was a big feature. 40 acres, 10,000 people, people of color from all over the world, as well as indigenous people. Uh, and they were not necessarily in cages, but they were on display for fair girl goers to come and gawk at. And according to McGee, and this was his agenda, it was very, he was very specific. He wanted to show that whites were superior and he had this pyramid. And at the top of the pyramid was the white man. And I'm using his words now. In the middle of the pyramid was the yellow man, and at the bottom of the pyramid was the uh, black man and the red man. Uh, so that was what fair goers were exposed to uh, in the World's Fair. They were exposed to pretty blatant racism. Now, as far as African Americans who were, were fair goers, of course, they faced uh, challenges as well. First of all, 
um, African Americans did want to have a presence at the World's Fair, not just as part of a human zoo, uh, but to highlight uh, Black achievement. Um, that did not happen. Uh, they did want to have a separate uh, a facility uh, where they could showcase Black achievement. Uh, they also wanted to have a what they called an Emancipation Day or a Negro Day. And that never materialized. So the only uh, image that Bear Grylls saw of people of color was one that was denigrating them. One was that one that was debasing them. Uh, so you did not get to see the full range of the intelligence and the culture, the rich culture of people of color. Uh, you were basically his his idea was to to he wanted people to, in a way, almost make fun. Of people of color to see them as inferior, and uh, the whole purpose of this was, was to show that these were people who had title to land, that they were not deserving of this land, and that it was the white man who represented civilization, who represented a progress, and these people of color were standing in the way of that progress, were standing in the way of civilization. So you had, so they had to be removed. Their land had to be expropriated because they were bringing something that these people who were inferior could not bring to the world. So that was the experience that, that whites saw. And it was and this what, what blacks saw too. Now, blacks did not necessarily have a positive reaction to the World's Fair. Uh, they were discriminated against. Like I said, this was a segregated city. Blacks were allowed, they were admitted into the fairgrounds. But once they got there, they faced uh, humiliating treatment. Uh, they were barred from a lot of the restaurants and concession stands because they were barred on the outside. So of course they were gonna be barred on the inside. Uh, they were not allowed to showcase what they brought to the table. Uh, that was denied as well. Uh, they were uh, outraged by the treatment of uh, black military uh, forces who were not allowed in the barracks and were forced to be separate to uh, the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs, who had uh, intended on meeting at the fair, were so outraged that they decided that they were not going to be participating. So there was boycotting of the fair uh, by Blacks. So that was the experience of Blacks in 1904 at the World's Fair, um, both inside and outside. They face racism and discrimination. And of course, that's a major legacy of Manifest Destiny, which is that which is racism and oppression. Right, they're very much yeah. Thank you so much. Um, let's move to Mia. So you were born, Mia, in the uh, Philippines, which was acquired by the United States, right, as, as a part of its empire in the late 19th century. Um, colonial history has enduring kind of effects on counties and, and territories across the world. Um, and your family has a pretty unique connection to St. Louis that dates back over a hundred years. So can you share a bit of that family history? Give us a sense of that. Yeah, um, I'd like to speak to it from two different angles. Um, first of all, I didn't even know that I had this connection to St. Louis, I moved here in 96 because my boyfriend at the time was from here. Um, so uh, it wasn't really a family connection, but I just discovered last year um, that my great grandfather Ramon Ochoa was here and he actually, so the first way I wanna speak to it is kind of um, jumping off from, from what Gwen has said, um, he worked at the World's Fair. So the pensionados, their first assignment before being um, sent to campuses across the country was to serve as ushers or waiters in uh, the Philippine exhibition, um, which was, yeah, one of those human zoos where they shipped hundreds of indigenous people from the Philippines to come and be on display. Um, and what's amazing about that is that I arrived in this country in 1985, so right after the People Power Revolution, and as a 13 year old going to high school in Wisconsin, um, one of the things that people repeatedly asked me, my peers, was, Do you, did you live in a tree? Um, or, or they'd ask me if I ate dogs. 
and I couldn't understand like where this was coming from. It just, just was baffling to me. Like, you know, my grandfather went to MIT, <laughs> like, where is this coming from? Until last year when I found this pamphlet in the, uh, the History Museum archives, um, which was the program for the, the Philippine village. And it, it described the, you know, the indigenous people and how their tree houses were amazing. <laughs> and then I started watching these films and I realized like what an effect that had. So Gwen, to your point, this was this strategy, this agenda was so effective. Um, generations later, I was realizing that these children who saw these exhibits at the fair had passed down these ideas to their descendants so that I can appear in this country almost 100 years later. And that's the thing that people think about when they think about uh, Filipinos. And it's still super emotional to me now because that was the reason for erasure. That's why I denied my culture. That's why I just wanted to be like other white kids. So here I am with, I have half siblings who's, who grew up in the Philippines and they have a very different um, relationship with with being Filipino, and it's not mine. I have really good friends who say, I don't, I don't really think of you as Asian. And it's supposed to be like a compliment, because I guess I've done a really good job of becoming something else. So sorry about the, <laughs> the trauma, apparently. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Um, so that's big. And then uh, the second aspect of it was that my great grandfather spent four years in the States and then went back. And like almost all of the pensionados, I think there ended up being about 300 of them, they um, took places in society that were very influential. They became governors and bishops and Supreme Court judges. And, they started universities. Um, so they, they influenced every sector, every aspect of culture. And this was also a very deliberate strategy um, by McKinley, you know, of benevolent assimilation. Um, so along with the American school system, they, they placed, they strategically placed the pensionadas back into the native culture. My great grandfather became an officer in the Philippine Constabulary. And that was part of our uh, mythology, like our, 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 our family history, right? Something that we were incredibly proud of. Um, you know, there's one painting of him that was done by a famous national artist of him in his uniform. Um, and he was I, kind of was stationed all over the country to different provinces. So I'm doing my own research now about this man. And, and like you said, Prinny, it's like, do your family history. Um, and I find out that the Philippine Constabulary, which was basically um, modeled after the American military, was the force that kept America in power or in control in the islands all the way from 1902 when the, world, the war supposedly ended through the Second World War. Um, so they, there, there's documentation of their campaigns against the insurgents all over the country. Um, and I didn't know any of this because my family was assimilated, right? I didn't even, I was not taught about the Philippine-American War in either country. I didn't even know it happened. The only thing that I learned was about the pensionadas and how amazing that was. And then 1945, which was liberation, when the Americans liberated us from the Japanese occupiers. And everyone's like, wait, we were being occupied that whole time. <laughs> I like the nationalists would say like, okay, well, the reason that we were even involved in World War II is because we were a colony of America. Of course they had to attack us. So that was just a super, you know, kind of shift in perspective where you're going from 
you know, here's this man who was completely changed by his experience in the U.S. He came back and, um, like, uh, raised his family as an American family. He named his, my grandmother's name is Daisy. Um, and that was so unusual at the time, 1918, they wouldn't even allow them to put, he wouldn't put that on her birth certificate because it was, it was not, you know, normal. Um, but, you know, we, my transition to the States was so easy in some respect because we, I, English is my first language. We not only were taught American in English in schools, but we taught it, I mean, we spoke it almost exclusively at home. We watched American television, like I grew up on Sesame Street, Little House on the Prairie. Um, Lola Daisy, that was my grandmother, she would make um, special trips to the import store so we could get Pop-Tarts and Kellogg's cereal. So when the decision was made to send me here, like my dad came and my aunt came, it was not, it wasn't supposed to be traumatic. You know, it was, it was just moving like climate zones, you know, <laughs> um, but that's not true. You know, I don't like, as a, as a teenager, you don't know that, but um, I think Alyssa, what you said about just the, that this trauma stays with you and it, it's generational. Like I look at my own kids who, you know, ironically went to the middle school that now sits on the site of the Philippine exhibit. <laughs> mm. Until 1990s, they were called the Wydown Igorots, which was the native tribe that was on display there. Um, and there's so much that they don't have that I wasn't able to pass on to them because it was lost already to me. And to some degree, the generation before me and the generation before me, because pretty like you were saying, like there's so many people in my family that don't even question our values, you know, our, like my individualism, my, you know, focus towards achievement. Those were things, when I talked to my sisters again, they're like, well, it's different. You know, I, I, I don't have access to those nuances of culture um, that they do. So um, I think in terms of um, healing, like uh, I think as an adult now, I'm much more conscious of code switching that I do. Like, I don't think I even knew there was a code <laughs> and that I was shifting um, to be able to survive or to be successful. Um, I'm sure that getting a divorce was part of my decolonizing process or just being unwilling to continue to put on a facade in my own home and, and to realize the basis of a relationship with this uh, Caucasian person was flawed or based on a, a trauma response to some degree. Um, I also feel like I'm less eager to be the one to try and bridge a cultural difference um, now than I was before. Kind of like I'm just taught, you know, being tired and um, it's a position of privilege to not care if someone doesn't understand you, you know, because again, it isn't about survival or safety or uh, or your career isn't on the line or whatever it is. So yeah, I think like being older and more confident myself, I can kind of start to explore those nuances of cult culture that I've lost and, and um, want to reclaim. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ria. Um, a powerful um, kind of meditation, really, on the on the effects um, of colonization. You you raise kind of the issue of kind of you know monuments or just you know how in a sense these legacies kind of live on through monuments. And many of the monuments in St. Louis are kind of tied to have this direct connection or link with this this understanding of manifest destiny. So what? You know, other panelists, can you talk a bit, a bit about just the, the messages that kind of monuments send in your 
in your estimation, and Alyssa in particular, if you want to kind of raise the the uh, debates over the Columbus statue in Tower Grove Park, that would be um, that would be wonderful. So, can we talk a bit about kind of monuments, and, and again, kind of thinking about the legacies of this of this understanding of, of really manifest destiny as both a kind of logic but a process, right? And then how how do how do we we think about um, kind of monuments today, especially in the St. Louis context? Anyone can, and that's open to everyone, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I would love to talk about how monuments um, in, in connection with historical trauma, like we know with like psychological trauma in the more mainstream sense, there are triggers that cause a stress response within the nervous system that can cause the fight, flight, freeze, or shut down. Um, when we think about monuments, uh, they act as a reminder of public narratives of who is welcome in the space, who's not welcome. Um, and so the Christopher Columbus statue is one of those. And um, my friend Lindsay Manchek was on the commission and did a lot of work as a local Native American person and how this statue, which has been there for a long time and been protested for a long time by natives in our community, um, and so when we think about statues such as this, like why, why is it up there? This is a park that's open to everyone, but is it really? Um, and so I think it's a very important, like under the radar way that historical trauma has continued to be enacted because it is a reminder, it shows who won the battles um, and holds up some of these colonizers. Do others want to, to speak on the, the issue of monuments and our kind of current debate around that and conversation? Like I said, we're, we're grappling with those issues right now at the Missouri Historical Society, of course, Thomas Jefferson statue. But, you know, it, it reminded me of, of what uh, the arrogant Attorney General William Barr said about his legacy. And he said, well, you know, the winners write, write the history. So... He thought he was fine, so it was arrogant of him to think that he was going to be a winner, first of all. But he was talking about who controls the narrative. And with a lot of these monuments, that's what it's about. It's about who controls the, who controls the narrative, who tells the story, whose voices are heard, and who is not heard. Uh, there was a monument here in uh, Forest Park that has been removed uh, that was extolling uh, Confederate soldiers. Like uh, Melissa said, a, a public park. Number one, this was a union state. So why are we extolling uh, Confederate soldiers? But there are other monuments that people are beginning to question because everybody has to have a voice and everybody has to have a buy-in. And if it's uh, a monument that extols a particular point of view, that extols a narrative, that elevates a narrative, that elevates one group of people over another group of people, then it needs to be questioned. And I, I, I welcome this reckoning uh, that people are demanding to have more knowledge about these monuments and their meaning. And if they don't have meaning that is inclusive, that embraces people in a positive way, then you know, we, we, need to, we need to deal with them. So, so I, I, monuments are very, very important. Because that monument in Forest Park was there for oh, almost a century. And it was taken down, what, a few years ago. So people were passing by that monument. I'm not sure if anybody ever read the, what was written on it. Uh, but it was, it was obvious that this was a narrative that really demeaned people of color. It demeaned people of goodwill, regardless of color. Uh, and it extolled people that we're now calling traitors. We didn't call them that before, but we're calling them that. Uh, people that were, that uh, uh, advocated the enslavement of other people. I call them human traffickers, uh, who, <laughs> who believed in human trafficking and trafficked in human beings. So yeah, monuments are, are very, very important uh, because we all see them. It's like Alyssa said, they're in a public place, in a public park. It's not something that's in a book that you have to go and look for and read is there for everyone to see. So monuments have a particular uh, resonance and importance uh, 
because everyone is exposed to them. So they're very, very important. My um, great grandfather, <clears throat> that's not right, my great uncle, great great uncle, my great grandfather's um, brother in law, gave the land and the statue of Robert E. Lee that's in the middle of Charlottesville. And um, he was an acknowledged stone cold racist. And on this is in the 20s. This was all about saying, so all you people who came back from World War One, all you black and brown people, don't forget who's in charge. Don't forget who's under the hooves of this horse on a pedestal that you have to look up to as you approach the courthouse. Don't forget. And don't forget that all this Jim Crow is in place and it's all enforced with racial violence and terror. Don't forget. So it was very much part of a larger strategy to keep that white supremacy in place and oppress um, anybody who might resist that. Yes, thank you so much. So uh, let me um, pause here and say that we're, we're going to kind of transition now to a kind of Q&A portion. So I would invite those who are on the call to submit um, their questions via the chat. Marvin's back with us, who's going to kind of, you know, keep an eye on that as well as I think ask questions as well. So yeah, do you, do you, would you like to, to jump in Marvin with anything or? I have I have a many more questions that I could I could ask. So, so far we don't have any questions that have come in yet. But um, again, for those of you who are interested in asking questions, I know I've been really enjoying this conversation. Um, you can use the Q and A box that's towards the bottom of your screen. Um, you just click it, and then you can type a question, and then I will read that out to uh, to the group. Um, you can pat you can make it specific for uh, for one of our panelists. You can make it for. Uh, for Kiana, our moderator, or it could be a general question um, for everyone to, for anyone to kind of pick up. Um, but um, I guess for, uh, for the entire group, uh, my question is, how did you all get interested in this kind of connection of um, a family history? Well, I think, uh, Rhea, you already explained it, it's kind of that this process of finding yourself um, uh, through um, the process of, of immigrating here to the United States and then discovering who you were in your ancestry. But definitely for, for, uh, for Alyssa and Prinny and uh, Gwyn, how did you all, um, uh, was it something that was, uh, that was held, for, uh, your family history, was that something that was held from you? Was it something that you had to go searching for? What was that process like of uh, finding yourself or beginning to find yourself? Because I think we're all still on a journey. So I, for me, I know that I've been interested in my family history for a very long time. I come from a very large Mexican-American Italian family um, and just wanting to know more about where we came from, how we ended up in Texas, how did the Italians end up in Mexico. Um, and there's um, Dr. Jennifer Mullen, she has decolonizing therapy. Um, she talks a lot about learning uh, your history and learning about your ancestors to start decolonizing yourself and your work. And so as a mental health practitioner, I want to be able to provide the best services possible. And so that also means starting with myself. Um, and so I went and I researched more about my family, learned about the railroads in Mexico, which was kind of like the family that stayed in Mexico got rich off the railroads. Um, but there's a lot more to the conversations. And so I think now as I'm kind of transitioning to the next part of my career, being fully licensed, being able to practice on my own, I want to make providing a decolonized therapy a part of my work. Um, and that means looking at myself, looking at my community and how can I support change in that by looking at where we came from and how we got here. Um, so. That, I would say that about, and I happen to like history. I, I didn't quite realize it until grad school or like undergrad and grad. I do enjoy learning about history and learning about um, the history that doesn't 
get included and like learning about pecan shell or strikes and like things that aren't included in Texas history, which you have to take two times um, as a child in Texas. So that's kind of, that's my background. Um, and Gwen, what, like, um, have you gone through a process, because you're from St. Louis, from what I understand. Um, with Mississippi Roots. Oh, uh, Miss with Mississippi Roots. So have you traced your ancestry, and how did you really get involved with um, kind of becoming a historian? Well, I would say that came from my mother, <laughs> because my mother grew up in Mississippi, uh, one of the most racist states in, in the country where she was growing up, and she grew up, I grew up with her telling us stories about what it was like growing up in Mississippi and the challenges that black people faced. I always tell people when I was a five-year-old, I knew who Bilbo was you know, because my mother talked about him. And uh, he was a racist governor and, and then a senator uh, of, of the state of Mississippi, who in the 30s and 40s was advocating sending black people back to Africa. In the 30s, yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, that piqued my interest in history, learn, wanting to know more about, I wanted to know more about racism, to be perfectly honest. I wanted to know more about racism and the fight against racism, uh, because my mother was very much, um, I call her a race woman, because she was uh, very, very uh, opposed uh, to, to Jim Crow, to racism, and she made that very clear, and she, she, would, not, she would not participate in that and uh, so that that's where my my interest came from it's from my mother and of course and practically uh, all, all my sisters and brothers uh, went into some form of history or historians awesome uh, so it runs in the family and then Prinny and then we also have another we do have a question in the chat box so uh, Prinny how did you like was that something that was passed on from generation to generation in your family or how did you get involved especially connecting the indigenous um, the European and the, uh, and the African uh, an ancestors. I don't know, Pretty, you're frozen. Okay, we're going to transition and get back to Pretty when, um, uh, when, it's, when it's a little bit better. Um, there's a question that asked, uh, so someone came in a little bit late um, and they said, are there any good books about the experiences of people of color at the World's Fair? Well, I, Robert Rydell has written about, he, he's the foremost authority on, on, World, on the World's Fair. He's done a lot of research on, on the St. Louis World's Fair. Um, I would recommend anything that he's written, uh, first of all. And like I said, we have a resident expert right here at the Missouri Historical Society, Sharon Smith, who is, like I said, is a leading scholar. And um, if you have any questions about uh, the World's Fair and any aspect of the World's Fair, she is the person to talk to. Awesome. Um, while we wait on, um, there was a, uh, Etta Daniels, who um, helps manage Greenwood Cemetery, a certainly African American cemetery here in St. Louis. Uh, she said, I don't have a question, but just want to thank, uh, thank these ladies for a thoughtful, powerful, and moving presentation. So thank you, Miss Etta. Um, I wish, I hope that uh, Prinny uh, can uh, hop back on because there's a question is of, is there a coming to the table discussion group in St. Louis? Um, and I don't know if uh, Alyssa, Gwen, Rhea, or Kiana know if, if there is a discussion group about kind of like bringing people together like that here in St. Louis. I don't know if there's a formal. Okay. There's been some um, witnessing whiteness groups as yeah. well, but they tend to be very um, also location-based. I think the YWCA um, has those groups, um, so that might be similar. Um, I think, I think with witnessing whiteness, it's not necessarily multicultural. Mm -mm. <laughs> so uh, people should be aware of that. <laughs> um, so, Prinny, the question, the question came up, and I thought um, you'd be the perfect person to ask. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Um, but there was a great question that came up. Is there, um, is there a coming to the table discussion group 
um, or anything like that in St. Louis that you know of? Or does coming to the table travel around the country? Coming to the table has uh, 42 groups that before the pandemic were called local groups because they had geographic ties. But the magic of Zoom means that people, if you go to the Coming to the Table website and look for local groups, you'll see a whole list. And um, we encourage folks to do a little bit of browsing around to connect with one, maybe talk to somebody organizing it, go to a meeting, see how that one fits. Try another one if you prefer. Um, do, I do recommend looking for a time for your time zone. So I know there's a group in um, at least one group in the Minneapolis area, which might suit St. Louis folks. Thank you. Um, another great question: Has your study of your family history and other histories helped you understand and heal your personal historical trauma? Um, I think so. Um, I think it's, it's, um, it's definitely, I feel like it's opened up emotions that I didn't realize were there. So, and I'm making the assumption that that is part of the healing process. Uh, it's complex, I think. I think, Alyssa, maybe you were the one who mentioned that. It's like, there's layers and layers of this stuff. Um, so I have to be okay with the ongoing nature of the process. Um, but to answer the question, I feel like, you know, the more I know, the more, you know, on the one hand, you're like, what? You know, it's, I, I mean, the funny thing is in preparation for this program, I just started asking my dad who is in the Philippines, like, okay, so, how did he, like, we never met him, like, how did he pass away, like, you know, and he said, oh, he, he, his heart, he had heart failure, this is my great-grandfather, he had heart failure during the war, um, but it was because of something that he had picked up, and in the mountains, and I'm like, oh, what was that about, and, and I had not no, I had no confirmation at the time about his involvement with, um, with the, what he, what he did with the, um, constabulary and he's like oh he was fighting insurgents I'm like oh right there it is and there's no like hesitation there's no like oh this is what he was doing <laughs> so you know this was I don't know two days ago <laughs> so it's a constant healing process <laughs> but uh, I, yeah I think um, with genograms, it can be uh, like, as opposed to genealogy, which is uh, genograms focus on the relationships between members of the family. And you can also often see these dynamics keep playing out of like separations or adoptions or um, a number of these types of interactions between people. And, it, and I think it helps and it also, um, one of the things that was most healing for me was like my great grandmother put flowers on everything. Um, and she also had epilepsy and stayed in her, her mother's house and never left. And just learning about these dynamics and like, Oh, that's why I have to put flowers on everything. Like it's partially something that is inherited. It's not just, um, it's not just like, any one thing. So I think it's definitely a process and it can be helpful to be able to have discussions with other folks who are also thinking about what is decolonization and what um, like what patterns are present in ourselves and in our families. Well, thank you, Alyssa. Um, Prini? Um, yeah, I think there are in a sense, two sides to that because <clears throat> maybe particularly as a woman, I'm aware of patriarchal attitudes, practices, cultural beliefs, behaviors in the family and beyond that are very much tied to colonization. So um, 
And it's just what everyone has been saying, kind of this constant process of looking at how do I step away from that? How do I notice it? How do I step away from it? And how do I um, recover myself? On the other hand, the, um, this kind of elite colonial family, white identity, um, I, I, the gift that I hope I'm continuing to grow in myself over the years I've been doing family research and talking about you know, anti-racism conversation is how do I step away from, delete um, attitudes, behaviors, practices that I have that are um, oppressive to other people, to, to people of color, to yeah, all people who are different from me. Um, and that feels like also very much a constant process and very much a um, stubbing my toes and scraping my shins and um, putting myself into complete embarrassment um, regularly enough. It's like, okay, this is what it's going to be like and just have to keep at it. <clears throat> Gwen, I know we have like three more minutes, but... Um... Uh, but Gwen and then uh, Kiana will give you some final words after Gwen goes. But the healing process, Gwen. Oh, the healing process. You know, I, I was thinking about, I think that's a complex question, and, and I was thinking about uh, group trauma. And I'm a part of the group. Uh, I'm a part of this, this Black community that, that has uh, been impacted by racism and discrimination. Uh, but I, I don't think we pay enough attention to the impact that it has on the people perpetrating the racism and the oppression. Uh, we always see who's on the receiving end. I think we need to look more at who's perpetuating this and the negative impact that racism has on white people. I don't think we look enough at that. Uh, they're experiencing trauma too. And that is a trauma that we need to address and deal with as well. Thank you, that's a, some good thoughts. Uh, Kiana, um, any, any thoughts from you? I know uh, you've been asking a lot of the questions, but any kind of final thoughts for you um, from the research you've been doing and then also kind of tying everything together from um, what these phenomenal uh, panelists have kind of discussed today? Yeah, re re remarkable group of panelists. I've, I've learned so much and just been really, you know, kind of reflecting um, on quite a bit just in, in listening to all of you. So thank you. First of all, to our panelists for for such such wonderful insights. Um, I think there's much to be said, but the thing that that kind of keeps, I guess, coming up for me is just the the fact that you know Baldwin, James Baldwin, um, says many important things, right? <laughs> but one of one of which, of course, is the, the this notion of history kind of living on, right, and and being very much a living entity. Um, and I think that's a that's a key theme of what we're all kind of saying um, and what we've been saying. It's just the way that history uh, lives with us and gets enacted again and again in many in many different kinds of ways, and that we're we are grappling with that right, even as we are ourselves kind of creating our own kind of history and, and and seeing ourselves, of course, as connected to legacies of the past. I really appreciated hearing. Um, all of you kind of speak about your your family um, and your kind of your personal trajectories into this history and I tell my my students all, all the time that history is really um, autobiography right that the topics that they often find themselves gravitating towards are very much in some ways linked to kind of their own stories for me like Gwen my, my folks grew up in Mississippi the deep south I was grew up fascinated with that particular state and its history of racial violence and racial trauma and it, it, tracking my family's history um, out of, from, from Mississippi, those who remained, of course, but those who, who moved upward um, uh, in, in the North, right, in the Midwest, just grew up fascinated with that story. So I see all of what I do is kind of connected to that. So thanks so much to, to Mark for organizing us and thank you to all of our fabulous panelists for, for um, yeah, for blessing us with all of this, this, this wonderful knowledge. Well, thank you all. I'm going to show this last slide for 30 seconds, and we will wrap up.
you can all see that hopefully. Um, thank you all for joining us today. I want to thank all of our panelists. I want to thank Gwen. I want to thank Rhea, Alyssa, Kiana, um, and Prinny um, for, um, for having this dis amazing discussion. I know there's probably a lot more questions that Kiana wanted to ask and uh, our panelists wanted to respond to. But thank you all for coming out today. And um, for those of you who are participating, thank you all for tuning in today to today's amazing Chow and Chat. Um, there's going to be a survey that pops up afterwards. Please fill out the survey. It helps us in better inform um, our programming. Uh, also, if you'd like to become a member of the Missouri Historical Society, um, you can go to mohistory.org backslash support. And that will definitely help us out. Um, and uh, please, everyone stay safe out there. And thank you all for tuning in. Thank you. And have a great rest of the day. Bye, Marvin. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Great to, great to speak with you. Yeah. Bye.